All right, we are live at Myth Vision Podcast. Welcome, everybody. I have Rabbi Tovia Singer with us today. I am very thankful that you're joining me. How are you, Rabbi? Uh, I'm very well, and I'm glad to be joining you. And and uh, I think should I just share the backstory on this, or just there's always a backstory. Of... Yeah. So there was some complaints that. Um, the number of Jewish guests that you've been having on Myth Vision was not commensurate with, did not comport with the general population. And therefore, we had to get a Jew in here because there were just way too many Gentiles. So right. I'm happy to represent the Jewish people um, this evening in it, Jerusalem. Yeah. I'm thankful that you gave me the opportunity. Uh, it's always an honor. Seriously, on a serious level, I, I really value uh, your insights, especially the keen insight that you have on the New Testament in particular. It's like you know your New Testament better than Christians. Kind of odd, isn't it? <laughs> I, I, I don't know if I ever told you this, but uh, I don't know, maybe 15 years ago, I was lecturing in New York. It was a big crowd in Brooklyn. And after the lecture was over, uh, th a lot of people come over to you after the program is done. So there's this whole crowd around me, and I could see from the corner of my eye that my rabbi was there. That means when I was in fifth grade, I was like 10, 11 years old, my rabbi, his name was Rabbi Frankel, and it was the same face, and he's standing right there. He just listened to a presentation given. And he made his way through the crowd to me, and he just turned to me, and I shook his name, same face, just grayer. And he said to me, he said, you know, Tovia, if you would have known your chumash, meaning your Torah, like you know the New Testament, you would have been just fine. And <laughs> he was like so blown away. Because when I was in fifth grade, I was like, I would have dreamed, I would pray for like a COVID thing, like, like to, to be off from school for two years straight. I was like, so he was like just blown away. Like if you would have known your your Torah, like a, like a Christian Bible. So actually, that that happened. Yeah, I actually, <laughs> you know, I got introduced to you. Don't know if I ever told you this. Hmm. I actually found you when I was a Christian apologist, wow. learning and going up my ranks, trying to figure out how to defend my faith, and I found a DVD series called Faith Under Fire or Faith on Fire, something like that. Yeah. And you were engaging against, I think it was, William Lane Craig. That's right. And you were young, not That's saying right. anything bad about you right now. I like the, the, the gray uh, lightning bolt across your right. airline. You know, that's pretty hardcore, I got to admit, you know. But, but you were on fire. And I said, this guy hates god <laughs> i was a, i was a christian no you know what i mean like i'm thinking to myself like no look at look at him he doesn't see the truth of christianity now of course i came from christianity i came from the new testament and then years later i'm thinking i'm talking to the gentleman right now on a show right right yeah how the tables I, have turned crazy yeah that was a show i must have done like 20 years ago um lee strobel of all people was the host of the show it was a tv show and i was debating nathan lane craig who i i think pretty much is like in the christian in the christian world he's probably the best apologist in the english-speaking world and we debated the doctrine of the trinity on christian television right and it's it's on my youtube channel it's, it's all over the place and it was it was a very very interesting experience very shocking experience and I have to say that, you know, Nathan Lane Craig really was being very honest in when we were dealing with the doctrine of the Trinity um, and the Hebrew Bible. And I was impressed that he was as forthright. And that all happened on, on Christian television, which is something I don't think I've ever said publicly. But in many, many cases, when I have done in the past TV shows or I'm on radio on a Christian station, yeah, if things go the way they went with Lee Shrubble and Nathan Lane Craig, they just won't put up the show. They just, they'll, they'll just delete the show or sometimes they'll um, edit the show. 
I mean, I, I don't think I've ever said that publicly, but they do. And I've become a little <laughs> wiser over the years. But yeah, oh yeah, I've done shows with all sorts of people, TV, whatever it is. And let's say it's a, it's like a real conservative Anglican show from England. I've done that. And the show just did not go the way they anticipated. And they just tanked it. <laughs> I'm not going to say more, but it ha this happens. Listen, so then I, uh, <laughs> this reminds me of Paul, for example, just to be funny, where he's like, look, I once knew a man. I'm not going to brag or anything, but I knew mm -hmm. a man, right? Who went to the third? No, but seriously, you you upset me as a Christian. You were so um, blunt and bold about the Trinity on that episode that it. I always remembered your face. And I was thinking, okay, this guy, like, he's dangerous. And uh, just, I didn't want to like, I didn't like what you were saying, you know, because it was uncomfortable. But um, I do appreciate you uh, giving me the opportunity, this goy that I am, to uh, yes. hang out with me on an episode. So seriously, I want everybody to know before we get into this, okay, he has a YouTube channel and a website, outreachjudaism.org. And for those of you who are watching, you know I'm an atheist. You know that he is a practicing Orthodox Jew which makes him better than me. And so <laughs> much better. <laughs> Listen, much. if you don't see the comedy, you're missing the point. Okay. Well, I, I, I just have to admit, we, we joke and clown and always have fun, but um, your entire purpose and what you do at outreach Judaism is to convert you to Judaism. Right. Right. His real name. People don't know this. I mean, people think he's Derek is <laughs> I, I shouldn't do this live. Uh, his his real name is <clears throat> Derek's real name is Leibish Pasquale Goldberg. So we <laughs> we all right. Go ahead, continue. Listen, we talked about this. You weren't. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm Why sorry. I, I forgot that you hit the red button. Can we okay, erase that, please? Uh, yeah. Anyway, seriously, it's to keep. First of all, you're trying to prevent Christians from converting right. Jews but also to bring Jews back to Judaism who may already have converted. So mm. this is something of your, one of your major focuses is doing that. And you have a YouTube channel where you are right. always dropping nuggets. And I have you on to deal with the New Testament. This is what we do. I also have the Patreon for anybody who's interested right. in helping support us at Myth Vision. And recently I added the members tab. So you can actually be a member on YouTube and it's going to give you like, special badges and emoji options and eventually at some point i'll probably have exclusive member only episodes or whatever you know we'll, we'll, we'll go from there but anyway done right, let's go let's go back to our story beforehand that went okay. to this you're that telling did, me it? when you watched me debate nathan lane craig and we would that was about the doctrine <laughs> of the trinity yes you really were thinking this guy is the devil i really thought like looking at you seriously now remember yeah. now i used to think demons were in like inanimate right. objects and stuff okay like i thought everything was like i was just very very superstitious in everything i thought but i was looking at your eyes and i thought you hated god you looked like you hated uh in my view right mind you that's because you're coming at my view right. and this is probably why to give you a little psychology i guess why christians who are attacking you or come after you they think that way, I bet. They're thinking that you're on the wrong side, starting with the fact that they're Trinity, they're Jesus. This is true. So everything you do is in opposition to their worldview. I felt that way. And then, of course, my deconversion process took place, and I realized, no, you know what? This, the arguments he's saying make a lot of sense. I mean, most of them, okay? We'll talk about the other ones off air. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> but seriously. That, yeah, right. Yeah. It, it, it ruffled feathers with me. And I thought to myself, okay, William Lane Craig never gets beat, like never lets this kind of stuff happen. Right. How the heck did he let this guy just say this and not right. like debunk everything he just said? And he didn't debunk it. It really made me go, what the heck? Why aren't these guys debating you today? I don't I don't get it. They all want to keep sending Michael Brown, but none of them want to challenge right. you. I don't get it. Right. I've been emailing them myself, trying to get a debate set up for you, and none of them want to. They want to keep throwing 
you know, what's up with that? Yeah, yeah. You're raising a very interesting point. I know we're going to calls. You could stop me yeah, at any. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, we'll get there in just. But a this is a very big problem in the Christian canon. Uh, trying to explain away why don't the Jews believe this if it's so obvious and so clear, and we'll probably discuss this on. And we could take close or anytime you want. We can, we can go. Just for you, the viewer knows I can't see anything. I only hear, kind of like stories and acts i was about but, to say <laughs> i know that <laughs> <laughs> kind of reminds you of a chapter in acts depends yeah. which version but whatever right, right. um <laughs> yeah but th this is a big issue and the, the christian contributors to the uh canon had to figure out devices to explain that away and one of the devices could not be, could not include, well, the reason why the Jews don't believe this is because the Jews have read their Bible and they just draw a different conclusion than we Christians do. Because everyone's like, well, why? Right? So therefore, it has to be something else. It could be the grand mystery of 1 Corinthians in chapter 2, verse 8, that just, this was a great mystery that no one knew, no one understood, and if the rulers of the epoch had even known this about the, 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 the glory, the Lord's glory, they would have never even crucified, you know, Christ. Right. So, right, it's just a grand mystery, and the Jews are blinded, and that goes back to Romans. So, right, this is a very big issue for Christians, so how to explain this away? I have one question for you, my personal question, and I, I, I could probably already get to your answer, but I'm not interested. I want you to say your answer because I think that you and me would agree here. When you've poked holes in Paul, I've had other experts come on and say, well, Paul's doing similar stuff to what we find other Jews doing with the Hebrew Bible, the way that they might kind of use the Hebrew Bible to explain things. However, would you agree that while Jews may have applied text in new context with new meaning in certain eras, none of them have come to a conclusion of a Christ figure whose blood as a human poured out, etc. Is that where you would draw that line and say, while Paul might be what you call molesting the scripture, the reason hmm. it's such a, to use the term sin, if I can use that term, such a wrongdoing is that he's not, just using it in the same manner that rabbis may have used it throughout history. He's applying it to an entirely different thing, what we call Christ. This is a very good question. I, I want to illustrate this. I first want to share this one point that I've never, uh, I've never said publicly. There are thousands of videos of me on air. So, um, I, I'm not asking you what song it is, but if I ask you, Derek, like, do you have a favorite song or a favorite group? Or, okay. So I, if I ask you, what are your top favorite songs in the world? Are you, like, when you hear it, you put your headphones on, you're just, right? So yeah. whatever you want, right? Mm -hmm. So probably some crazy Metallica song. I'm kidding. So <laughs> the point is that if you, if, if there's a song that you've just heard so many times and then someone does a cover of it, I mean, someone else plays it, even if they change one note or even elongate a note, you know, just a little more vibrato or a little less, it just you notice it immediately because you're so intimately familiar with this piece of music that any variant of it you immediately, okay, to the religious Jew, okay, to the person who's immersed in the Hebrew Bible, it is so we breathe it. It, it, it is so um, a part of us. It's part of our our breathing, our bloodstream. It's part of our DNA. That when anyone toys with it or plays with it, we feel it. We know it. We know exactly what's happening, and that's why the religious Jew always has that sensitivity that others will not. And it should be said that what I'm saying is not some idea that's way out there. If you go to any mainstream university, it doesn't make it, if you go to any university and take a course in New Testament, whatever, history of Christianity, any course like that, 
On the first day, the professor is going to say the following. Going to say, you cannot understand the New Testament. You cannot understand Jesus unless you understand the Jewish world from which he emerged. That's day one, first, that's how it starts, okay? So what I'm saying is completely not controversial. So when you come from the religious Jewish world, and remember, it's not like we're studying modern Judaism. The, our primary sources in rabbinical school, in yeshiva, throughout our lives are the ancient texts, the Tanakh, the Mishnah, written 2,000 years ago. That's what we're studying. Those are our primary sources. That's the, that's the stuff that fills the marrow of our bones. So, so therefore, we could sniff this out. And what I'm going to do is I'll just give you an example of this to understand what Paul is doing. This is not that Paul has um, using some sort of device that rabbis use, but he's really uh, completely uh, damaging the plain meaning of the text. So the plain meaning of the text is called the pshat. In fact, you know, Derek, about a translation of the Bible into Aramaic called the pshita. Mm -hmm. Everyone knows that. That's an Aramaic word. It just means it means simple, it means the plain meaning. Now, any homily, any drash, any subtext can never undermine, can never upend the plain meaning, can never. You, you, you can have a drash, a midrash, a kind of a homily, some deeper explanation, which I, I'm glad to do on air, but it can never undo the plain meaning of the text. But that's all Paul is doing. Paul is deliberately sabotaging the plain meaning of the text. And what I'll do is I'll just give you a very fast example. It's a very famous example. But in, in Deuteronomy chapter 25, verse 4, we have a very short passage in Torah, four words, Loi sachsom shar bedisho, Hebrew. You shall not muzzle an ox when it's threshing. The, the Torah is very concerned about caring for animals. You can't cause an animal to suffer. So when your ox is threshing, you can't put a muzzle over it because that's the stuff the ox loves, okay? Right. Paul quotes this verse in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 10, very famously. And he literally says, do you think God cares about oxen? And then he continues to say, no, it really means giving money to the church, to missionaries. What? So what Paul, Paul literally is saying that the plain meaning of the text is should be completely dismissed. He says God does not care about ox. He doesn't care about their suffering. He literally says, "Does God care about ox?" That is molesting the text. That's not a homily. Christians are entitled to their homily. They can do it all they want. But don't I don't buy into their homilies. They, when I'm on here or I'm writing books, or whatever, do I always deal with the plain meaning of the text? But what Paul did is he delivered it's chicanery it's a game of uh it's a game of dealing from the bottom of the deck it's playing high the ball it's not this is not honest hermeneutics it's i it, it and and that's what i want people to see just by the plain evidence so that's exactly correct that was a very important question thank you rabbi i appreciate that I'm going to take some super chats now. We'll get into questions. Feel free to super chat your questions and uh, really appreciate the support, everybody. Um, thank you. The English Longbow, thank you for the super chat. If chapter, Isaiah, if chapter Isaiah 53 was divided by Christians, why Jews kept the same format, not adding the last passages of Isaiah 52 to the beginning of 53? You have... You have that person is very intelligent. It's a very good question. So Isaiah 52 ends with verse 15, and then there's a break, and then 53 starts anew. And if you read any of my commentaries and heard me, it, I explain that the, the chapter break is artificial, which means it is the fourth servant song. Okay, But it means in verse 13 of chapter 52, it begins with, Avdi, my servant, okay? So the question is, why is there a chapter break altogether? Like, how did he even get there? Well, this is a great question, and the answer is that it's a different speaker. That means in Isaiah 52, verse 13 through 15, God is the speaker through Isaiah. 
you know, behold, my servant shall prosper. So God is speaking, and most people don't understand this, and because they don't understand this, they just cannot understand these 15 passages, okay? So let's break it all down. Isaiah 52, verse 13 through 15, who's talking? God is speaking. Okay? That's uncontroversial. From 53, verse 1 through verse 8, who's speaking? The Gentile kings of nations are speaking. They are shocked. How do you know? It says so in 52 verse 15. They will, they, they will literally, so shall he cast down many nations. Kings oh, will shut their mouths because of him. Why? Because what had never been told to them, they will see. What they never considered, they will finally understand. And they will, in 53, 1, they take over the speaker now are actually speakers are the Gentile kings of nations in the Messianic age, and they're going, Me hem in Lushmoa say nu, Uzre Hashem Ami Nigusa. That means, who would have believed our report and looked to whom the arm of the Lord, Lord has been revealed? So the transition there is not, it's not departing from the fourth servant song, but the speakers change. And that's why the chapter break is there. In verse 9 of 53, God resumes speaking. So we have God 52, 13 through 15, break. Gentile kings of nations, 53, 1 through 8. That's what everyone misses. And then 53, verse 9 through 12, God resumes speaking. There it is. Thank you so much for that answer and that super chat. They're back again. The English longbow says, why Isaiah 9, 5 is 9, 6 in Christian Bible. That's one example of many verses where the number is different. Is there a general reason for that? Big reason for that humongous reason for that, and that's Matthew chapter 4. <laughs> Sometimes there are variants that are really harmless reasons that are, that are not interesting. This one is really interesting, and that is in the book of Matthew, when Jesus begins his ministry, that means we're done with we're done with the infancy narrative, and we're going to Jesus beginning his. So what Matthew does is he takes the passages from the end of Isaiah chapter 8, verse 23, excuse me, chapter 8, the end chapter 8, and chapter 9, and conflates them and removes all sorts of words from there. So if you begin with Isaiah chapter 9, verse 1, in a Christian Bible, it comports with Matthew chapter 4. But if you compare the two, you would go, bang! Half the words are removed, slammed together, and that's why the break is done. So in that case, that is one of the most... Um, one of the most criminal breaks in the text. And that's why the Jews won't put up with it. So many of the chapter breaks, so you know, uh, were arranged, and the verse numbering were arranged by a Anglican, uh, Anglican bishop. His name is uh, Steve Langston, I believe his name is, in, I think, 13th century. But this one is really nefarious. So when there's not a gameplay, the Jews go, all right, we'll go. If we're good, we, we'll go re reference verses. We might as well try to use the same verses. But in this case, the reason is because Matthew hammers it. It's one of the strangest texts when you compare Matthew 4 with this with Isaiah chapter 9. And that's why they cut it in a completely different way. There are other very nefarious examples of this, but this is like bang, zoom. This is huge. That's why it's cut differently. Thank you so much. Scott Daniels sure. asking, is Nathan Lane Craig a Freudian slip or a clever nickname? Because early on you were calling William Lane Craig Nathan. I believe you said Nathan Lane Craig. Oh, right. It's Robert. So um, it's William Lane Craig. Okay. Who's Nathan Lane Craig? I don't know. It sounded like you said Nathan earlier. That's why Scott's Could like, be. Nathan Could Lane? Be. Yeah, William maybe Lane a simple Craig. mistake. Uh, Doc Pleromanot, thank you for the super chat. He says, Jewish indifference to Jesus versus gospel projected perversion of rejecting the message. I'll probably have to repeat this question, by the way. Um, <clears throat> seems ahistoric. If the law was kept and Romans were appeased, why care about a smattering of converts? So I'll read it again. Jewish um, indifference to Jesus 
verse gospel projected perversion of rejecting the message seems a historic. If the law was kept and Romans were appeased, why care about a smattering of converts? Okay. You're referring to Matthew chapter one? Is, Doc, did I, here, Doc. Because Matthew chapter one is an infancy narrative. Why would Jews have an aversion to Matthew chapter one? Um, and I hear, I'm just going to just say this. And if it's, this is something and like, like why would we care about Matthew chapter one and two, that's the infancy narrative. Um, and why do Jews have an aversion to those chapters in particular? Is that the question? I don't want to miss uh, characterize the question, answer something I'm not being asked. Uh, yeah, that's what and, I want to make sure too. Um, yeah, and what does this tell us about the early Christian moment? And how the Jews viewed it? Is that I just I'm not sure what the so question. So they is. follow up. Doc says, "Why would Jews be rejecting any message?" And I guess it's oh. pertaining to that. So, oh, okay. Because where do we begin? <laughs> there are 89 chapters in the Gospels. Four of them are infancy narratives, two Luke, two Matthew. Matthew's infancy narrative, those two chapters, are, I can't say the most outrageous, but really, the, they're, they're really quite outrageous. The Jews would have an aversion to it because Matthew engages in so many, this is the, the kind of, if you're a young man or a young woman, do not do what Matthew does. That's not the way to behave. I'm just, it's, it's important to be honest. Matthew is engaging in complete corruptions of the Jewish scriptures, and he's also lying to his, he's lying to his audience. Where do you begin? Uh, so let's lock this up really quick. Uh, Matthew begins with, this is the genealogy of Jesus Christ, son of David, son of Abraham, okay? And he proceeds through verse 16 to give us the whole list of genealogy, the whole list of the link from, it's really Joseph's genealogy. So if Jesus was born a virgin, it's not even relevant. It's one of the crazy elements of this. this is the least of the problems. But the moment you introduce the notion that Jesus was born to a virgin, that means that Joseph was not Jesus' father, and Joseph's genealogy then becomes irrelevant. So we're actually presented with a putative genealogy of Joseph, and it's irrelevant to Jesus because G Joseph wasn't Jesus' father. Let's just put that all aside. In verse 17 of Matthew chapter 1, the author states that this is not an arbitrary collection of names, but there are actually three sets of 14 generations from Abraham to David, and that is 14 generations, from David to the going out of to the Babylonian exile, 14 generations, and then from the Babylon exile to Christ is 14, 14, 14, 14. Well, you know, when Jews hear that, they're going, what? Now, why is 14 really important to Matthew? It's humongous. Why? Because 14 is the number of King David. Every Hebrew letter, this is called gematria, every Hebrew letter has a number associated with it. So David in Hebrew is Dalet Vav Dalet. Incidentally, the, the name David appears more frequently in the Hebrew Bible than any other name, more than Moses. Okay? So David is 14. So Matthew, this is not like Matthew just saying 14, 14, 14. Matthew is going bang, that this is all pointing to, to Christ. The problem, what Matthew did is, this is a Las Vegas show. This is a, this is a magic show. This is a this is sleight of hand. He literally blows out four generations. Just They're just not there. He actually takes out one too many. So the whole thing is complete sleight of hand. Moving further, we then come to Matthew one twenty three. Well, we're told by the author that Jesus was born to a virgin is a fulfillment of what it says in Isaiah. Isaiah, just so you know, lived 700 years before Jesus. Okay, Isaiah lived during the Assyrian Empire. But when we go back to that passage, we're going, what? It doesn't say virgin there, and it's taken out of context, and the articles, are changed. it's all a mess. This is not accidents. This is not... 
You know, this is not oops. This is very deliberately done. I mean, this is the kind of stuff that if you're an attorney in the United States and you do this with a contract, you get disbarred for it and you go to jail for fraud. Okay? I mean, do I need to go further on this? I mean, in Matthew 2, 13 through 15, we're told that the family, which is from Bethlehem, not from the Nazareth, as we're told in Luke, um, has to flee to Egypt because Herod is seeking to kill the kid. And they go down to Egypt. I mean, Mary, Joseph, and Jesus go down to Egypt to fill what was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Out of Egypt have I called my son, Matthew chapter 2, verse 15. Well, if you have a Christian study Bible, cross reference that to Hosea chapter 11, verse 1. The text actually says, When Israel was a child, then I loved him, and out of Egypt have I called my son. Like, what? Like, how did you just rip that out of context? So, Jews are incredibly offended by this. I mean, this is molesting the text. This is not this is not a mistake. This is not, you know, someone who no, this is very deliberately done. I can go on if you want, but the way the Jews are characterized in Matthew 1 and 2 would I remember as a kid, I was what, 16, 17 when I read the Christian Bible the first time. And of course, I'm I'm beginning with Matthew because, you know. Augustine wanted to make sure that Matthew appears first. You know, and I'm just reading this the way the Jews are portrayed. I mean, I mean, if you're gonna portray the Jews or any ethnic group in this way, of course people are gonna be offended. I mean, are you insane? So if you're if you portray the Jews, I remember just reading this infancy narrative, I don't know, maybe I was 17 years old in a King Jan, and the story portrays is mind-blowing that that Herod finds out that the king of the Jews was born in Bethlehem. This is in Matthew chapter 2, verse 6. Okay? And Herod doesn't like that idea because he was the king of the Jews in his view. And then he sets off to kill the kid. Meanwhile, you have Magi, Magi who presumably what's in view is some Persian a group of non-Jews. They're coming from the east. Let's just say Persia, okay? And they're, that means they're not Jewish. And when they find little Jesus following the star to Jerusalem and then to Bethlehem, they worship the kid. They bring gifts for the kids. I mean, think of the reason why they think there are three is because there are three gifts. We don't really know no number of people. So here you have the setup. I mean, the, the Jews, upon hearing that the Messiah was born in Bethlehem, want to kill the kid, and in fact, kill every child in Bethlehem that's two years old and younger, and the non-Jews want to worship the kid. I mean, like, of course Christians hate us. Of course they do. To you, to you Christians that don't hate Jews, I, like, tip my hat to you, because if I was raised on the New Testament, if that's all I read— and I read nothing else, I would hate me. I would think, what kind of people is this? So this is very much from the get-go. Matthew, in my view, is far more anti-Jewish than John, and, and there's debate over this. But Ma this is all a setup, that here we have the Jews and the Gentiles both observing the same circumstances, and one of them wants to kill the Messiah, and the other one wants to worship the Messiah. Bingo! I mean, of, co of course the non-Jews hate it. Of course the Christian world despises it. If they read this kind of this, this kind of this screed, and of course they're going to draw that conclusion. Thanks, Rabbi. I appreciate the response. Doc, thanks for that super chat. Gray's 174 says, is Isaiah 53 about Israel? Yes. Just Jews getting cornered. So this is what they wrote. Just Jews getting cornered because Jesus does fit question mark we secularists can just come up with ways to dismiss apparent prophecy fulfillment but it looks like jews are trapped here i don't understand the question i do okay. i do i do okay so this is a point about the book of isaiah if you don't know this you can't even approach this chapter isaiah contains 66 chapters and 90 percent of it literally is poetic um, using um, f figure of speech. This is not, the book of Isaiah reads nothing like the book of Joshua, Judges, Samuel, and Kings. Very, very different. There are about five, six chapters that are using standard prose, standard chronology. The book of Isaiah is completely out of order. 
Isaiah 53 is the fourth of four servant songs. Are the Jews cornered? No. The only thing is, we it is axiomatic, and this is something that all Christians would agree with, that the author of Isaiah 53 presupposed that you read the chapters that introduce it. If if we don't if we don't agree about that, then we live on a different we occupy a different planet. Okay, it is axiomatic that the author of this book presupposed that when you got to fifty three verse one, you have read the chapters that introduce it. If that makes no sense to you, then you want to be watching reruns of I Love Lucy and not listening to me. That doesn't make sense to you. All right. All right. So now we got that out of the way. So what happens is the Jews read Isaiah. I'm giving an entire lecture series on the book of Isaiah right here in Jerusalem. And when I meet Christians on the streets, and I've done this and it's on YouTube, and I ask them, what does it say in Isaiah 52 or 54? They have no idea. So they engage in this isogesis, which is completely, not the the proper hermeneutics. Okay, so if, what you do is, I'm going to do this fast, and someone, if they want to, could type this out, so I'm going to go through this. If you begin with the first of the four servant songs, remember, there are four servant songs here. This is not some Jewish idea. You can open up your Anchor Bible Dictionary. You can open up your New Revised Standard Version. You can open whatever you want. Go to the commentary, the Christian commentary. They'll all tell you the same thing, okay? Isaiah 41 begins the first of the four servant songs. By the time you're in 53, Isaiah presupposed that you've already read the chapters and introduced it, okay? So if we go to Isaiah 41, verse 8 and 9, who's the servant? Israel. I didn't sneak into your computer. This is not some invention of the Jews. If it was invention of Jews, it's the invention of a Jew named Isaiah, okay? Isaiah 42, verse 6, it's a Brit Am, a covenant nation, a light to nations. 43, verse 10. 43, verse 10 says, Atem edai no mashem avde shabacharti. I want to translate that for you. You are my, listen very carefully, you are my witnesses, declares the Lord. I don't care what translation you use. No matter what translation you use, it's going to read, it's going to, Render this correctly. You are my witnesses, declares the Lord. Avdi Ashebacharti, my servant. Same exact word, my servant whom I have chosen. Okay? So the servant is not one person, but it's witnesses. Atam a die, plural. Let's keep moving. Isaiah 44, verse 1. Who's the servant? Israel. How do I know that? Because it says so in the text. Isaiah 44, verse 21. Who's a servant? Jacob, Israel. Please read it for yourself. The most dangerous thing you can do as a Christian is just read Isaiah 7, Isaiah 9, Isaiah 53. Hi, I'm in church. Of course you're going to get in trouble. <laughs> Isaiah 48, verse 20. Who's the servant? Israel. How do you know? And please, I beg you, use your King James Bible. Make sure there's a huge cross on the Bible. If it doesn't have a cross, don't use it. <laughs> what I'm trying to explain is this is not like some sneaky thing that the Jews did. You know, is this is not like it, it like we're blind, there's scales and veils and schmales over eyes. I don't make that up. I mean, Paul actually makes that case in Second Corinthians three. No, please, you open up your most Christy Bible you can find. Okay, the New Living Amplified Jesus Christ, Son of Mary <laughs> Bible. I'm not, I'm not, if this stuff wasn't so outrageous, I'm not trying. I mean, please, because like if you're watching me and you're a Christian, there's a lot at stake here. Like, if Jesus is the Messiah and the second person of the Trinity, you really should be worshiping him. But if he's not, it's idolatry. A very bad idea. It's the mother load of bad ideas. Okay. So I'm I'm asking you to use your most hostile witness, a Christ 
Jesus Christ crucified with a crucifix on the front of your cover. So not just the cross. I want the guy on the cross, on the cover of the Bible using. The point is it doesn't make a difference. They're all pointing in one direction, that Israel Jacob is God's servant. Isaiah 49, my friends, is what? Isaiah 49 is a conversation between God and his servant Israel. How do you know? It says so. Isaiah 49, verse 3. Please look it up for yourself. Israel, my servant. And the, the conversation continues where God calls upon the servant. The servant is not all the Jews. One important point that people miss. The servant is not every Jew. It's not, you know, Noam Shamsky, Norman Finkelstein, and Bernie Madoff. It's Bobby. It's not every person who's a Jew, okay? It's not like Friedman from the New York Times. Nothing personal, but it's not these people. The servant is uh, this is the righteous remnant of the Jewish people. And in fact, in 49.6, God calls upon the servant to bring back the Shifte Yaakov, the, the tribes of Jacob, means all the other Jews who are not religious, and most Jews are not, and to be a light to the nations, or Lagoyan, bingo, pow. And then the servant goes, please read 49.7.8. This is a really moving chapter. The servant says, I can't do this. It says, I've been despised, rejected, hated by kings. I mean, literally what you find with the three, how am I up to this? And then verse 13, I mean, Isaiah is really very moving. And, you you know, when you, when you go to Sunday school, you're missing out on all this. The servant goes like, I can't pull this off. And I feel really rejected. And God asks the question, verse 15, the prophet asks the question, let me ask you a question. I mean, think of this moving portrait. Imagine a mother nursing her baby. Would a mother abandon, reject the the child that sh that's that she's suckling? These two might forget. A mother might abandon her kid, but I will never forget you. Like, how could you not be thrown to the floor in tears? Isaiah 54, by the way, we can continue. Who is it speaking about? Who is despised in Isaiah 54? Now, Christians have to look this up. I'm not trying to be... Um, I, I, I need to highlight this. Christians really need to open their Bible. Why? Why do you know 53 by heart, but not 54? Who is the one who suffers? It's a woman. Who is that? Israel. And she is the one who's forlorn, despised, without child. And... In 54, God promised her that God will lift her up and no weapon that's forged against you will succeed. I mean, what a mind-blowing chapter. So in 54, it continues that the that the one who is despised, rejected, is in the singular, and it's speaking about Israel. Incidentally, all Christians concede that Isaiah 54 is speaking about Israel in the singular, and 53 is speaking about Jesus. Do you know how outrageous that appears to the Jew? So, right, this is the trouble you get in if you all, if you take a 66-chapter book and you just read 53, ignore everything that introduces it. That's exactly correct. It was thank you for your question. Thank you for that, Rabbi. That was fun. Doc Pleromanot, again in the house, says, Christian hand-waving claims say the negative language in the New Testament reflect localized Jewish disputes. But doesn't the edict New Testament ligature to the Old Testament and Judaism show anti-Semitism was more than intra-squabbles? I, I just want to make sure I understand that. So isn't the the um, the, the anti-Semitic passages in the Christian Bible, isn't that uh, just Jews fighting with each other? The, uh, it sounds that's... like, yeah, because, you know, they'll try yeah. to say that it's not anti-Semitic. They'll just say it's just two Jews, or a little small squabble. Right. So, I mean, so I uh, first one, so one could say, I, mean, I want to, you know, address this. I could sort of pass this away very quickly and go, well, let's go to the very earliest letter of Paul. And it is probably the oldest surviving Christian literature and that's the first Thessalonians, no doubt written by the hand of Paul. Age, like 49, 50, that's really, really early, right? And there's no debate over its authorship. So Paul, in chapter 2, verse 14 through 16, just blames the Jews for killing Jesus, and, are, and the Jews are therefore contrary to all mankind. And he's not writing this to Jews, so no, not at all. 
Paul's letters are almost always written to non-Jews, not to Jewish people. There is an exception, and that's in the book of Romans, where you have where he is re- addressing both groups, I mean Jews and uh, and Gentiles who are Christians, to a church that he has not yet visited. He will, but but when he's writing Romans, he had not yet he had not yet been to Rome. So so I could. Um, dismiss it in that fashion, but it's much, much deeper than this. The Jews are portrayed as the devil in the Christian Bible. And that's a very, it's a very serious charge, but it's a very sophisticated charge. And most people look at passages like mm, John 8, 44, where the Jews who don't believe are called the seed of the devil. Satan is your father. And they go, well, that's a really nasty thing to say. But they don't really, people don't really grasp. They just don't wrap their head around what the charge is here. And it's it's rather sophisticated. In Christian thought, Satan, the devil, uh, does he know the truth? Uh, and it, no matter what you're doing, like, stop and listen to what I'm about to share with you. This is, you cannot miss this point. In Christian theology, does Satan know the truth? I mean, really know that God is who he is and Jesus Christ is the Son? The answer is yes, he very much does know. But he rejects Jesus anyway, and he rejects God anyway, because he is an the chief enemy of God, because he went into rebellion against God because of his pride. This has nothing to do with Judaism. This is pure dualism. Okay, I'm not going to get into the Judaism view of Satan, but right now understand this, that in in the Christian view, Satan is was the highest of all the angels. And he went into rebellion, and it all plays out in Revelation, how it all ends up, okay? Revelation 13 and so on. So when you say that the Jews are the seed of the devil, this is not like just using, you know, saying some pejorative thing about Jews, you know. What you are saying is the following, is that the Jews deep down know that Jesus is the Messiah. They know, they really deep down believe in Christ, but they reject him anyway. Only the devil can do that. And it is for this reason that people who have a, unflattering view of the Jews, Christians who view the Jews with contempt, they're not insane. Uh, Christian anti-Semitism is completely rational. If you read the Christian Bible and the way the Jews are portrayed, they're not portrayed as people who just don't know any better. It's not like, you know, they were just people who were happened to be in China at the time and just didn't know about it. So they're not angry at them. They, they didn't know. That's why I don't believe. But the Jews deep down know. In fact, we know it so well that we even we even insert, infuse Christologies into our customs. Like we have three matzahs at the Passover Seder for the Holy Trinity, which we claim not to believe in. And we put holes in our matzahs because we know that Christ was pierced through. And we break the middle matzah because the second person of the Trinity was, was broken. Okay. This is the way the Jews are portrayed in the Christian Bible. It's not they just don't believe. It's not just that they're they don't know or they no the jews really know the truth but they reject them anyways and only the devil can do them and this theme flows throughout we talked earlier about the infancy narrative like herod the great finds out that the messiah is born in bethlehem it's a by the way a complete the passage in matthew 2 6 is completely ripped apart from it from the from micah chapter 5 forget that for a moment okay but he then, well, why not just go there and like find, no, let's kill him, you know, and just let's kill all the kids in, in Bethlehem, okay? But this reaches a height. I want to, there are so many examples of this, but this is all over the place in the Christian Bible where the Jews are portrayed not as just not knowing. And the reason why this can't, no one would ever buy this is the Jews have a reputation for being clever, knowing the Bible, are the only ones who can read the Bible in its original language. We're the only ones who were there at the time. The Japanese were not in the land of Israel. Why don't we believe it? It has to be that they're enemies of God. Let me give you a very, very striking example of this. 
Um, let's go to the end of the book of Matthew. Go to Matthew 28. Um, so in, in Matthew 28, we are told that um, that the the Jews said we need to have guards. It's very famous. That we just Jesus is dead. He's put in the tomb, and the Jews the Jews are very concerned. The chief priests are very worried that. Um, <clears throat> that the followers are going to steal the body. So we need to have Roman guards placed in front of the tomb to protect it, to make sure no one steals, steals the body and then claims an empty tomb. Okay. This device is really dumb. I'm sorry, but it's really dumb. And no one gets it, and I don't know why. Like if someone were to steal the body, Derek, when would they steal it? If Jesus crucified on Friday, right, and then we are told that he resurrects some early Sunday morning. What would be the ideal time to steal the body? Before the body's rotten, of course. But uh, I would say maybe no, the very... You, you got to steal the body. So you have mm -hmm. from Friday night to Saturday You would steal the it the night there aren't any guards. Right. You would yeah. steal it Friday night. It's dark. It's not like today with people like their streetlights. People didn't... Before 1860, no one left the old city of Jerusalem. Forget about it. That means the time to steal it is Friday night. That's when you get rid of the body. As it turns out, if you look, I don't know, I can't possibly be the first person that thought of this because it's so plain in the text. But literally, the guards are put there the next day, right. which means the guards are placed there on Saturday. That's it's why I said when you asked me, I was like, the night there aren't any guards. That's right, why I was saying. Right, the, the time to, it is almost... It is om I'm I'm just saying this. It's almost like God went into the mind of the writer of this. This is an M source, and just did this so that people could figure it out. Like, what good is God's being placed there on Saturday? Like, there's nothing. Like, it's so it's very silly. But this is not. I don't want to digress. But no one says it. I don't know why. I'm sure a lot of people say it. I just haven't seen it. Anyway, getting back to our story, what happens is the guards come back to the chief priest and go, gone. Like they basically report essentially that Jesus rose from dead. That means we have an empty tomb problem. Okay. Now, what should have happened is that when the priests and the elders, the Jews, find out that Jesus rose from the dead from the guards, who felt like dead, fainted like dead men, this should have, should have gone logically. Holy moly, I guess we were wrong about Jesus and we should follow him and worship him. And I guess he rose from the dead. What does anybody would say, right? No, they seek to pay off the guards to say that they fell asleep. That means that this is such a so, and the way racism, bigotry is conveyed. It's not by saying, oh, we think the blacks are this, the Jews are this, and using all kinds of words. No, the way hatred is conveyed is through storytelling. If you just say, use an inappropriate term to speak about any group of people, that's not what makes people uh, um, embrace a worldview of that person. It's the storytelling that creates racism, always. Bigotry is always created by storytelling. And if I told you that the Eskimos control all the banks in Hollywood, you go, what are you talking about? Like the Irish control. No, the, no, it wouldn't make sense. It has to be the Jews. Why? Because it makes sense to them based on a crystal, a Christian worldview, whether you're a Christian or don't. But you. So here's an example. I just took one very famous um, anecdote conveyed in Matthew. Here we have the chief priests and the elders who know now that Jesus Christ rose from the dead, and they're willing to pay. And this, of course, shows how the Jews control the world through their money. They own the banks. They can pay off everybody. I mean, these people who are just not fond of Jews today and think that the Jews just control the world, Protocols of the Elders of Zion, early 20th century uh, forgery, they're not they're not crazy. The reason why they think this is this is the Christian worldview. And this is why Buddhists don't hate Jews. 
This is why Hindus, there's no history of anti-Semitism in India. Why? Because the Hindus are, have not been loaded with this kind of screed that portrays the Jews as devils. So I, I, what I'm seeking to convey here is that the anti-Semitism found in the Christian Bible is not something the Jews are all kinds of whatever. No, it's the storytelling. The storytelling is what creates a bigotry in good people who would otherwise have a very, who would be philo-Semitic, and it makes them have a, a dark view. It in, nourishes within them a dark view of the Jews, although in every other way they're perfectly moral people because of the way the storytelling is conveyed in the Christian canon. Bingo, there it is. This has, there's so many questions that stem from this that I would love to probe and get your opinion on. But I must admit, we have tons of questions, super chats that we are backed up on. So um, I'm going to try and press you to to get through these because I don't want you to be here all afternoon. And then we if just... you if you ask questions like, what is the first letter of the book of Genesis? We can move through that really quick. That's the you problem. Know? You really do want to deal with these. I mean, you guys are like it. asking questions like, "What is the meaning of life?" And then say, well, "I don't think you can do that." The thirty. <laughs> you have five seconds. seconds. Yeah, five I seconds. Mean, yeah. Uh, so, all, all right, right. Next question: The English longbows back. Why academia presents Second Temple Judaism as a different religion from First Temple period? What's the difference between apart? Sorry, what's the difference apart from not having the Ark, uh, King, etc. Okay. All right. So let me. All right. Apart, apart okay. from not having the ark or the king, et cetera. Okay. What's the difference? So, the first, I'll just say this 10 second version. If you are a, a person of faith, you're a religious person, you then believe that Judaism is unchanged and only has to adjust itself according to the circumstances that surround it. If you're not a person of faith and you're going to see Judaism, it's going to, the, the worldview is going to be that Judaism is completely evolving and, for, and it just changes and morphs and changes and morphs to the iteration that we see today. Okay? So we're going to, to start there. Um, so as it turns out, that's a, the end of the modification of your question at the very end is very, very significant here. Because during the, during the first temple, we had the Ark of the Covenant in the Holy of Holies. That was set aside by Jeremiah. We have no idea where it is today. I could speculate, but I, we don't really don't know where it is. The other thing that comes to an end at the very beginning of the Second Temple period, which means during the Persian Empire, is the end of prophecy. It means Malachi, Zechariah, and, uh, and Haggai, not in that order, are the last of the prophets. And then, basically, prophecy comes to an end at the time, basically, of Alexander the Great. Okay, So, so now we can get this. So at the beginning, from the Battle of Granicus, let's do that, okay? So from the Battle of Granicus forward, there are what Jews do not possess are prophets. There are no prophets in our midst any longer. Done. We don't have an Ark of the Covenant. We don't have the Urim Vitumim, which was a breastplate that the high priest wore, and he was able to see the light and get answers to very difficult questions. The point is, it was kind of, and this is where Second Temple Judaism, I love the way that question was asked. This is where it's different. It is, Malachi ends with a goodbye. I remember when my grandmother, who was the most important person in my life, I remember my last conversation with her. I'll never forget it. And she just told me, Tovia, you know, this is how I need you to live your life. We both knew that was our last conversation. She was in Israel. I was in New York at the time. I held the phone upside down because I didn't want to hear her. I didn't want her to hear me crying. But I was, she only had hours left at that time. And she gave me her final, this is it. You now know what you need to do. That was my last conversation with my my bubby. That's very much the way Malachi ends. Malachi essentially is saying is, this is it. You now have it all. You have the complete text. You have the 
remember the Torah of Moses that was given to you at Mount Sinai. And just know that one day Elijah the prophet will come, he will bring the coming of the Messiah, I'm paraphrasing here, and will set everything straight. Goodbye. Okay? And you now have all the information you need to be able to work this out for yourselves. So therefore, in essence, if you wish to say this, at that moment of the prophetic, the 120 members of the Knesset, means the ancient assembly, the prophetic period ends, there's no ark, no one no, none of that, um, that means that rabbinic Judaism begins then. What that means is you now have it all. You have all the information you need. Don't add to it, don't take away, and you can work this out through uh, using the methodology, rigorous methodology found in like Deuteronomy 17. So that is the change in this. We don't use, religious Jews wouldn't use the term second temple Judaism because it, it's really it's not second temple Judaism, it's just a totally different set of circumstances. And we don't have a king during the second temple period. So this is gonna have uh, there's more to this, but I don't want to overwhelm you. But this is very big in the difference between first and second level Judaism. Thank you for your answer. My buddy Robert Herring in the chat says, Rabbi, have you read the philosophy of Hebrew scripture by Yoram Hazoni? Opinion. No. Robert, thank you for the super chat, my I friend. I, I, you know, I, one of the things you notice about me is I, I don't, I rarely quote scholars, but I, no, I, I, I'm not familiar with that. Appreciate that, Robert. And thank you, Rabbi. Grays 174 is back. How do people interpret Psalms 22 before Jesus? As a whole passage, I'm not asking about the done to death like a lion talking point. So, so the 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 like a lion, we all know that this is obviously uh, pierced his hands and his feet to make it about Jesus. But how do Jews understand this whole pericope, this whole chapter, if you will, in Psalms twenty two before Jesus is on the scene and Christians end up, you know, capitalizing on that? This is really not a difficult chapter. The author, King David, is speaking in the first person. This is where everyone, I guess, misses it. And King, da King David had a lot of problems in his life. For those of you who don't know, uh, you wouldn't envy the challenges of King David. He had many enemies. Imagine not just a wife that mocks you, but you had a son, a child that wanted to kill you. Have you ever been betrayed in your life? Oh, yeah. Imagine if you had a, I mean, you ever, ever had a best friend that betrayed you completely? Had you ever had like the people who are your father-in-law is trying to kill you? Like imagine you're in this predicament. This is why King David is called a tzaddik, a righteous person. And he's very similar to Joseph, who everybody turns on. The key is you just read the text and it's really a simple reading. This doesn't require commentary. The text, the author is crying out and says, I feel abandoned. And I just encourage you to just open it and let the text speak for itself. The author is going, I don't know why, it's silent. I'm praying to you and I, I don't seem to feel that I am being answered and I'm in a lot of trouble. Moreover, when my ancestors, my forefathers cried out to you, you answer them, but for me, it's just silence. I mean, how could anybody not uh, relate to that? Like, God, are you out there? Like, I know you did things for my answers, and now, like, and I'm in a lot of trouble. The text continues to go, my enemies are all around me. Comparing them throughout the text to lions, to bulls, to wild dogs, see Psalm 22, the text are cut differently, verse 14. It doesn't, the lion doesn't just come up in verse 16 slash 17, depending if using Jewish or Christian. It's all over the place. In fact, you can dial this back, Psalm 22, going back to chapter 17, going back to chapter 16. I mean, this is what's happening. This is why I care about Christians, because they're reading Psalm 22 out of context. They're not reading Psalm 21. 20. They're they're just concentrating on these chapters. They, they, the, in their church service, it's highly liturgical, and that's when they're getting, they're getting loaded up with this. There, there's no magic here. This is not fancy reading. So the author is has been. That's all he's been doing is saying, "I feel alone. I feel rejected, and my enemies are all around me." Okay. 
He's, this is not a prophecy about anybody in the future. It's all in the past tense. Okay? In Hebrew, it's called the perfect tense. Okay? So if there's nothing in the future, this is going to happen. So the author is saying, I'm surrounded by enemies all about. If you had any of the problems I've described that King David had, how would you feel? Abandoned. And this all leads to the chapter that every one of you are familiar with, and that's Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. It's like this song has been building. You know the great, great pieces of music, whether classic, whatever it is, mm -hmm. they build, right? I mean, that's what it's, you know, it's like... Um, you know, it doesn't. It makes no difference. Just think of like the, the great pieces of music, whether it's Beethoven's Ninth Symphony or, 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 or uh, comfortably numb. You know, like it's built to this incredible. It doesn't make a difference. The reason why these songs are so intense is because they build and explode with these amazing solos at the end of Hotel California. I'm just using this to explain what what makes music great is the build. Okay, that's what makes these passages timeless. And what is Psalm 23? It's, I get it now. The Lord is my shepherd. And although I walk in the valley of darkness and the devil, I know that you, God, are there. Shiftacha v'shantacha, hemo yinachamuni, your staff and your rod. I mean, something that holds me up and something that beats me. They both comfort me. You have set my enemy. That means, so Psalm 23 is the crescendo. It's the experience. Explosion! It delivers the bang. And, you know, I just want to say this to you, like you're listening to my voice right now. I'm not, there's nothing magical going on. I just, just read it. You know, the text is, this is, this is not, there's not, these are not complex texts. I mean, mm -hmm. Daniel 7 is, this isn't. So that's all that's going on here. This is not a prophecy of the future. And then we look to these characters in Tanakh, and we go, okay, this is how we have to behave when we are going, we are enduring vicissitudes. And that's where it comes. The Lord ultimately is my shepherd. Good question. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So we got some more questions here. We're going to get through. I do want everybody to know, please, no more questions, no more super chats. The rabbi does not know how to give a one-two punch and he's done. Just to, <laughs> just to let you know, uh, I want to make sure I can get through this and um, I don't want to leave anybody hanging because we can't be here all day long. Uh, Rabbi, we have a critical uh, super chat. So here's a critical one. Considering Phleb Phlebas, thank you for the super chat. The Talmud rejects the explicit meaning of 1 Kings 11, 4 through 6, claiming Solomon did not worship idols in Shabbat 56b. Are right. the rabbis molesting the text? So, so this is a very good question. But as it turns out, the answer is found in the Bible, so you don't even need the Talmud for this. Uh, for those watching this, I have no clue what we're talking about. So in the whole book of Kings begins essentially with King Solomon's, he emerges and he's great and he's made the wisest person ever, and he just, who doesn't love Solomon? But in chapter 11, the author, Jeremiah, according to tradition, is the author of the book of Kings, um, just tells us that, uh, King Solomon himself worshiped idols. If you read the text plain there alone and on anything, so I ask you who's critical of the Talmud, if King Solomon was an idol worshiper, how? if you're a Christian watching, watching this, how is it that he, he is the author of three, not one, three books in the Hebrew Bible? Like, why would an idol worshiper be the author of three books in the Bible. Like, why don't you throw Song of Songs, Proverbs, and Ecclesiastes out the window in the garbage where it rightfully belongs? Now, as it turns out, we have the parallel text in the book of Chronicles. Chronicles is written by Ezra later. And the question could be is, like, why do you even need Chronicles? It doesn't essentially do what Samuel and Kings is. Well, the answer is no. The 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 book of Kings and Samuel are always there to be critical of the Davidic line and basically explain why everything was really, really bad. And Chronicles is written to a different audience, and that's the audience of Jews who had called the Shevet Sion, those who returned to Zion. And you'll notice there that it's that whole thing with 
King Solomon worshiping idols. It's just not there in Chronicles at all. That means Chronicles is dialing it down to what happens is that we see this in in first in First Kings chapter uh, ten, of course, and nine, where King Solomon is marrying all the wrong women, including the daughter of Pharaoh. But you'll notice that in Chronicles, it's like that he's worshiping idols. Somehow, not there. I mean, Ezra wants to make it clear that. Don't read that literally. But King Solomon is held to such a high standard that if he marries women who he should have never married, and they are bringing idolatry into the palace, his palace, then King Solomon is held accountable for it. Now, as it goes, King Solomon comes under pressure and he just moves the palace away with the daughter of Pharaoh outside of the Jerusalem area. But you just all you need to do is use chronicles. So it's true that the Talmud will sort this all out for us. But as a as a Christian, I'm just saying. Let's say you're completely hostile and critical to what I'm saying. Um, how do you you know how do you count that three that King Solomon is the author of three books in the Bible if he worshipped idols? That's really would require. Uh, that's that's I think a little more torturous. Good question. Thank you. Thank you so much. And. Uh... Another question by the same person. I just was trying to count, make sure we could get through all these super chats. So just once again, a reminder, because uh, I respect people's questions and, of course, the hard-earned money that they send in with their questions. Uh, please refrain from any more questions, uh, question super chats. You're more than welcome to show love if you want. I just don't want to um, not be able to get to your question. Okay, the next one is another same person, another critical one that's in Isaiah again. Uh, thank you for the super chat. How does the good rabbi explain Isaiah 49, 6 that clearly distinguishes the servant from Israel and the remnant? Surely multiple servants are possible, aren't they? Great question. Okay. Uh, so here's the deal. The servant, as I explained earlier on the broadcast, is not all the Jews. The servant is who? The faithful servant, we know, is the righteous remnant of the Jewish people. There's nothing new today. The majority of Jewish people are not religious and not observant. There's a faithful remnant. I encourage you to open up Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 12 through 16, where you will read about what the righteous remnant of Israel will be like. Read it and think about Isaiah 53. And the servant is called upon two tasks in 49 verse 6. Number one, l'hakim es shifte Yaakov, which means to establish, to bring back all the tribes of Jacob. Hello, which means that the remnant of the Jews have to bring back the rest of the Jews who are not religious. Two, they v'nosaticha l'or goyim, and I gave you for a light of nations. So, in Isaiah 50, 49, verse 6, the servant is given two mandates. Number one, you can't forget about the rest of the Jews. They name their be religious. They're not involved in Jewish life. you got to bring them back. Two, you got to be a light to the nations. you got to bring this message of salvation to the world. That's the role of the Jew. And we know that from going back to Isaiah 43, verse 10 and 11. The role of the remnant is to be God's witnesses. You know, believe and understand that I am him. Before me, there was no God form, neither will there be one after me. And as you would expect when the remnant is told, this is what you need to do, essentially save the world, both the Jews who are not the servant, who are not religious, and the non-Jews. The servant goes back and goes, like, how am I supposed to do that? Like, everybody hates me. Literally, everybody, I'm despised the king. I mean, the king hates me. People hate me. Bingo, there's your ID3. So, exactly. The servant, this is what everyone, as people think, you know, the problem is, I'm sorry, but people you know, learn what Judaism believes from Christian pastors, and that's how you get into trouble. So come to the Jews. It only makes sense. You want to learn about Chinese, go to the Chinese. All right, so 49, so 49 the servant is told to get the rest of the Jews and the whole world back. That's the mandate. And then the conversation continues. That, that's what it is. It's all in context. Great question. Yeah, okay. good question. I looked it up too. I was like, hmm. All right. Uh, another one from my good friend, Stephen. Uh, 
I always try to butcher this uh, name here, but either way, it's Stephen. In Romans 4, 3, Paul quotes Genesis 15, 6 in Greek, saying faith was reckoned to him, I'm putting in quotation, quotation here, Abraham, not to him, God. Does the Hebrew support this reading? And I could give you a little context if you want of what uh, I do, Dr. Tabor actually brought this up and was like, Paul applies right. faith to Abraham when really in the Hebrew he thought, and I don't know if you agree, it's actually meant to be applied to God in this, that God was the one who would be faithful. So it's ambiguous. And I think that the plain reading of the text is that God accounted Abraham's faith as righteousness. Just, we got to explain the context of this and what is being completely misappropriated here. I can do the fast version of this. Paul is conveying why it is faith rather than works. This is what Paul is doing everywhere. He's saying that it's faith that saves you and not works. And Abraham is going to come up a lot in Paul's writings, and they're all misapplied. In Genesis chapter 15, God is telling Abraham why God chose him and why he's going to have a child, and from that child didn't come a great nation, and Abraham doesn't even know who the kid is because he doesn't have kids, and the whole conversation takes off. But it's, he says, because of your faith. Okay? Now, in the Hebrew Bible, when faith is spoken of, it does not mean blind faith. It means trust. Abraham followed everything that God told him and kept all of God's commandments. It literally says that explicitly in Genesis 26, verse 5. And God, therefore, chose Abraham because Abraham chose him. So faith in the Hebrew Bible does not mean the faith of Paul. That means believing in something without any works. And that's what Paul is putting forth, and he, he, he's doing that already, and he's doing it all over. That's what Romans is devoted to. So that's why it's completely misappropriated. God actually says, I know that you believe me because of the things that you did. You follow. He was tested ten, ten times. So therefore, to say that Abraham had faith, and therefore you don't have to keep the law, that's the key. That's the. It's not just me or, or Dr. Tabor, dear friend. It, it, Paul is using this as illicitly using this as a device to say that you need to have faith and not work. That's what saves you. Look at Abraham. And that's completely misappropriating the text. So that's thank you. Here. Appreciate that. Grays again. Thank you for the super chat, my friend. What are the full range of possibilities for what happens to bad guys when they die? Eternal, temporary hell, annihilation. What passages support this? So, one sentence to introduce this. The Hebrew Bible is completely not interested in talking about what happens after you die. Because the Hebrew Bible, whatever you think, whether you're an atheist or a believer, the, whoever wrote this book or inspired this book wants you to behave in a certain way. And it's telling you this behavior is the, the licit and this is illicit. And here's what will happen to you if you don't behave the way, okay? Now, telling you what's going to happen after you die doesn't is not very helpful because it's unfalsifiable. So you need to know that. If you look at a holy book and it's front-loaded with what happens after you die, it's that should be a huge red flag. Because it's a much better idea to say, if you're smoking and you, you want to quit, your doctor will say, you're going to start coughing and you're going to run out of breath and your blood pressure is going to go up. It's like you have all these things that smokers go through and they finally quit drugs. Why? Because they see where this is all going. It doesn't make sense. So I just need to say that Tanakh is not interested in that because all these religions claim these awful things happen after you die. Like, like what happens if you bet on the wrong course? How dumb. I mean, if you were God and you really can control control the weather and the cosmos and history, like why would you threaten people with what happens after you die? Okay, done that part. That said, 
That said, there's very, very little. But it is present in Tanakh that after, so after a person dies, the spirit ascends to heaven. See Ecclesiastes 12.7. If I tell you, there's literally a handful of verses on this. So whatever happens after you die, are, are, the body is decaying in the ground. That means the senses we have, we can't see, we can't hear any. It's, it's a completely spiritual realm. So whatever it is, it's really not a good thing. You, of course, would appeal to Daniel 12, verse 2. So you have the everlasting contempt and damnation. Uh, for those who are wicked, you also could have a a place, spiritual place, where a person who dies with some sins, but is not really a bad person, and just the, the person did not repent for every sin, where a sin can be atoned for after death. Okay, and the only source in Tanakh for this is a passage in Isaiah twenty-two, verse fourteen. That's it. For the righteous, it's in the presence of God in a completely spiritual realm that's called Olam Haba, the world to come. Whatever it is, it's a it's a really good thing. Okay. And then at some point in history, there's the physical resurrection of the dead. Again, there's only a few verses in Tanakh that explicitly describe this. The um, we have Isaiah 26, verse 19. As an example, mention Daniel 12, verse 2. And then there's the physical resurrection where the soul goes back to the body and then physically resurrects from the dead. The Greeks thought we were insane for believing. They couldn't stand that. And you could see that Greek element in 1 Corinthians 15. But um, but it, whatever hell is, it's just a really very bad idea. But our sages make it very clear that no human being could comprehend because we're not using any of our senses. No human being can comprehend. Even the prophets couldn't comprehend what happens after you die. It's just a bad thing. And so there are no more passages than that. Appreciate it, Rabbi. Sure. No more religion with the super chat says, Samael, Satan, is the guardian angel of Esau Gentiles. No, not at all. Okay, so thank you. So... In Judaism, Satan is a blessing. And God created evil so that there would be free will, free will in the world. See Isaiah 45, verse 7. It's a passage that's mistranslated. Ra just means bad, evil. It's a plain two-letter root. And some Christian translators have trouble with it, so they translate it as catastrophes and earthquakes. Whatever, okay? God says literally, before I place life and death, good and evil, Deuteronomy chapter 30. So in Jewish, in the, in the Tanakh, uh, it's, uh, Satan, first of all, comes up very rarely in the Hebrew Bible, just very rare. But when he does come up, he's doing exactly what God tells him to do. In the Jewish view, if Satan did not exist, man would have no free will. He was creating God's image. He would just do he would just be programmed. He would just do who he would just be forced to worship God. So the virtue would be impossible. So God allows it to be some other force that would seek to seduce man away from God. God controls exactly what he does. In the book of Job, he does he does exactly what carries out exactly what God tells him to do. That doesn't fit at all with the dualistic uh, view of Satan in Christianity. And and therefore um, Satan is is a servant of God. He's a blessing because the virtue is only possible if there's an evil inclination. So that's a great question. Yeah, and then uh, the Esau as Gentiles. I heard that this comes up in, is it the Zohar? I can't remember, but I've asked some other people who are aware well, let's, of... Uh, let's just reduce this down and make it real easy. Esau um, is everything that's wicked in the world, and it's the f Edom... Esau, Esau is Edom. It's the final kingdom of the four kingdoms. It's the greatest, the most implacable enemy of the Jewish people. 
prophesied. We have whole books devoted to the destruction of Edom at the end of days. This is the last kingdom. In traditional Jewish thinking, it's the church. It's the implacable enemy of the Jews. It's a morphing kingdom. It's unlike the previous kingdoms. It begins as Rome, and then it morphs, becomes Christian in the fourth century, and then it divides and divides and divides, morphs in the 11th century, the Great Schism, Reformation. It's just very different than anything else. So it is Edom, Esau is the enemy of God, and it has a certain nature. I'll end with this, and that is, unlike other enemies, we have plenty of enemies. Unlike enemy, other enemies, the Ace of Edom seeks to portray itself as godly in following God the Father. He's he's a true servant of God. He he's like Ace of who tried to uh, uh, seduce his father into thinking that he's the righteous son. He was a side but piv. He was a hunter with his mouth. He just knew how to use words in order to seduce, in order to so look at me, I'm kosher. That's why the pig is the animal that embodies everything that is un holy and Esau, because the pig is the only animal that has the split hooves, what's called mafresis parasa, but doesn't chew its cud. So the Bible says that the only animal that has split hooves doesn't chew its cud is the pig. The pig, therefore, exemplifies everything that's unkosher, because the pig is Edom. The pig says, look at me. I follow God. I believe in the Old Testament. Look at, look at my split hooves. But in reality, look inside, and it's all idolatry. It doesn't chew its cud. So, yes, very, very much so. Appreciate that. Super chat, no more religion. And moving to the next one is Bry Guy, Zechariah 12.10, and they will look on me whom they have pierced. Thoughts? Right. And thoughts on the Talmud Sukkah 52a interpretation, the pierced was Messiah? <laughs> I mean, this is going to say, so it's 52 A and B. Okay. Uh, so, all right. So Zechariah 1210 is mistranslated by everybody in the Christian world. The text actually says, They will look to me, mean to God, because of the one that was pierced through, that was killed, and they will mourn over him as one mourns over firstborn son. Now, this is going to blow your mind away. And you're going to have, probably, most people are going to have to look at it because they won't even believe me. So the New Testament says that this is actually referring to Roman soldiers. We have a, we have a story that only appears in the book of John because John is presenting Jesus as the Lamb of God. The other Gospels don't. And the book of John says that there was a post-mortem inspection of Jesus' body to know whether they can break the bones of Jesus, that's a way of killing someone. That's the way someone who was crucified, killing them quickly. If their mm -hmm. feet couldn't support them, they died of asphyxiation. It was John 19, 34 through 37. Now, I want you to do this, if you're serious, is look at John 19, 37. And John then quotes Zechariah 12.10. But in John, in the context is this Roman soldier looking at Jesus, who blood and water came out of his side, and they knew that what they were seeing is true, to fulfill, and they shall look upon him whom they have pierced, and mourn over him as one mourns a firstborn son. Got it? So I beg you, plead with you, compare John 19.37 to Zechariah chapter 12, verse 10, and you will see that John molested the text, changed the pronoun from me to him. I didn't do this. The Christian Bibles do this. Now, what's insane is John 19.37 is not the only example of this, but there are really not many of them. And there's an example of when when Christians actually ignore the way the Christian Bible portrays the text and change it altogether. And Christians will tell you, Derek, that Zechariah 12.10 is a prophecy of the Jews killing Jesus, that they will look upon me whom they pierce, misrendering, mistranslating it, and therefore the Jews at the end of days recognize that they killed Christ. I ask you watching this, you know, that this is not... Please open up your Christiest Bible you have. Look at the commentary. Every commentary on Zechariah 12.10 is going to say, this is what the Jews are going to do at the end of the days. They're going to confess it all. Even though that 
annotation completely jettisons, rejects John 19.37, let alone that John changed the pronoun, okay? Okay, now you're asking me, now, you're asking me what's going on here. The Talmud isn't like telling you something insane, like, oh, we have a whole new story to tell you here, so I just got to explain, reference, Sukkot chapter um, 52, Nun Beis, Omen Aleph and Omen Beis, A, B. Uh, what's the context of Zechariah 12? Like, it doesn't begin in verse 10, and unfortunately, Christians don't read the first nine passages. Zechariah 12 is the a description of the final war when nations will come up against Jerusalem and God will destroy them. This is an end time prophecy. This is not something that happened 2,000 years ago. 2,000 years ago, the Jews didn't destroy anyone. In fact, the Romans destroyed us under their heel. Okay? At the end of days, we're told that there'll be a final war. Nations will come against Jerusalem, Jerusalem will be a heavy, burdensome stone to all the nations who will come against it. The Jews will have returned before the Messiah comes, and a battle rages. Please go to now Zechariah chapter 12, verse 9. This is all what the Talmud is discussing. In verse 9, it says, And the weakest of them, the weakest of the Jews, will be like David, even like the angels of the Lord of hosts. In battle, somebody gets killed. This is not like some like innovation of the Talmud. You don't need to with this. In battle... Although it goes really well for the Jews, some soldier gets killed in battle, or maybe soldiers get killed in battle. And everyone loses it over that, and they all mourn over him as they mourn over firstborn son. And if you want to know what it's like, you remember what happened to Josiah in the Valley of Megiddo? By the way, this is where Armageddon comes in. It's a misread of the text in Revelation. I'm not going to go there. So the key is now we can go to our Talmud. So the text is saying that at the end of days, in the battle with the Jews of Victorious, there is someone who gets killed, and that death in battle causes everyone to mourn, every family will mourn part, part read it in context, and this uh, mourning triggers a repentance. Okay? Now, the Talmud refers to this person as the Messiah, the son of Joseph. You be very careful about this. This requires a tiny explanation. The Hebrew word Mashiach, Messiah, appears in... Tanakh 39 times, it's never referring to who we call the Messiah. It's referring to any person who is chosen by God for whatever purpose. It could be a priest. In fact, it's most frequently a priest like myself. That's why that word appears more frequently in the book of Leviticus than any other. If you don't know this, you're going to totally be gone. You're gonna, you, you will then assign Rabbi Google as your chief rabbi. I mean, that's what's going to happen. And that's what happens to people is, is they go to Rabbi Google instead of going to the actual text, the primary source. Go to the primary source. So in the Talmud, when the term Mashiach ben Yosef is used, the Messiah son of Joseph is used, it doesn't mean he's the Messiah, capital M, or anything like that. It means that he is the person who is chosen, like King Solomon, someone who was chosen by God to build the temple. See Second, uh, second Samuel chapter 7, verse 12 through 16. And what happens is that person gets killed in battle, doesn't die for our sins, and then everyone mourns, does repents, and then what happens ultimately is that triggers the coming of the Messiah. And it's, if you want to know what it's like, go look at Josiah. So that's the context. Read the Talmud in context. And if you just read these missionary books and you're not really studying the Talmud, you, you're going to find yourself all over the place. But be very careful. In the Talmud, as in Tanakh, the word Messiah is used, not talking about the Messiah. Now, in the Talmud, you may have some places where the word Messiah is used about the Messiah. But very often it isn't. You have to be very careful with this. Thank you for that exquisite question. Thank you. Thank you. Did people steal bodies to do magic back then? Uh, I, I have... This is a question from uh, Super Chat. Uh, that's not my expertise at all, so I, I have no idea. Thank you for that, Graze. Um, is there a traditional Jewish idea that a resurrection will happen when the Messiah comes? And is yes. that the reason for Matthew 27, 52? So they're yes. trying to have the, everybody coming out of the graves. They're just like, hold on, the Messiah comes. We're supposed to have a real resurrection happen. Right. So I was with you all the way till the end. And I, I added that in. Like, I added that extra hole. Oh, I'm, you I'm, added in the zombie apocalypse. Yes. Okay. I kind of wondered. Okay. But Cause that, Cause once you, cause it's a very, this is a very big deal. The fizzle resurrection of the dead is very Jewish. And this is, you know, the ancient Greeks had a lot of respect for the Jews. Um, they did for a member reasons for our antiquity, Alexander the great 
who is someone who encountered Jews, whatever it is, the Greeks. But the one thing they that bothered them a lot is that the Jews believed in the physical resurrection. I mean, you read Cicero's Republic, I'm talking about the sixth final volume, and you can see what he has to say about what he thinks about Jews and resurrection. I mean, when Socrates is drinking hemlock, you know, you know, when he's about to, he's he, he's about to die. He's not really committing suicide. He's he's being executed, but that's his death. His speech, right? He's very happy to be done with this body, this wretched body of mine. It's a very Greek way of thinking. So the the resurrection of the dead, the physical resurrection that is in Tanakh, and you don't need to go to Daniel, um, because you know, I don't know what you think about Daniel. People have different views of Daniel. I'm not getting into that at all. But you can go to an early part of Isaiah, Isaiah 26, 19. You have a physical resurrection of the dead. And this is very telling about Paul. Because Paul is, in his most famous chapter, is pointing out that the plant that comes out at the resurrection is just a, a very different kind of thing than the seed that's put in the ground. Now, what I'll just do this with your permission, Derek. This is, I, I didn't hear your permission, but that's okay. Uh, this is one place where the church will move in one direction into Greece, to Athens, Paul, and then come back to Jerusalem on this. So if you look at the Gospels, the Gospels are backpedaling from this. Now, not in Mark, because Mark, you have no resurrection account. I mean, you only have the angels end in 16 verse 8. The last 12 verses are not there. Why not? Like, why didn't Mark have some ending where Jesus actually appears? But you see it very clearly in Matthew and really Luke, Jesus eating burnt fish, yeah. there's any threat. And, and then in John, you know, you have the you feeling the wound. So, so it's a very interesting loop where um, the, the church is moving in the Pauline direction, meaning Greece, and then goes, no, 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 that's not working, and then pulls it back. And you can see the trajectory spelled out in the Gospels where they move back to the traditional view of resurrection. The zombie apocalypse is, you know, a funny thing, I'll say this to you because no one ever asked this question, and I, I'm going to throw it to you. Not that you necessarily have the answer, but I wonder why there are Christians that go, that's really too weird for me to believe. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, why is that? And I always wondered, I don't have an answer for it. So, of course, if people got came out of the graves in Jerusalem and just started introducing themselves, then the question would be like, like, no one said anything about it. I don't know, whatever. But it seemed very striking that Christians who are believers, who believe in miracles, like, why do they pause on that one? Like, so what? Like, why is that? Is that really like the, like if a worldwide flood, walking, talking snake, but no, coming out of the dead, like Lazarus? Okay, like, there's something very striking about that. That people are troubled by Matthew twenty-seven and the resurrection. In Matthew I'm I'm with you. Yeah, like it, does that make sense? They, to you? Yeah. Do they have the same hesitation with the slaughter yeah, of the is? innocents? Like, what's what's going well, on? Well, that's here, not a miracle. Let, let, I'm let just think. saying, like, is it because of the historical lacking of any evidence or nobody writing about it? Nobody says anything about it. I wonder, but right. but I I think it's really not every average Christian. Most Christians just accept the story. Right. That's why never... I said Christian scholars. That means yes. really devout devout Christian scholars, evangelicals. I'm not interested in naming any names. But they're quite yeah. a number. It's not just one that they when they do that. They're going well. Is it it's historic? allegory? Like, why don't you just why don't you just say I, I believe it? I'm a Christian. I can't prove it. You know, and big deal. So there's a ton of stuff that happened in the first century. No one reported on. Although you would think that you know, like Philo was alive at the time. Philo was born in 20 BC and died in the 50s. All right. Anyway, but, but just to, to our our original question, just just to sum it up that would be a clear reason why Matthew's trying to say that is to try and say the Messiah came, uh, the resurrection must be soon. And he's implying this uh, zombie apocalypse to try and make it a quote unquote Absolutely. fulfillment. Okay. Right. In your Olivet discourses. Okay. It's imminent, right? That means when I say Olivet Discourses, you should be thinking Luke 21. You should be thinking Mark 13. You should be thinking Matthew 24. Okay. It's imminent. It's happening, okay? This is not like the synoptic consoles, pow, bang, and it's all over the place. No, it's 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 very clear this is a very early uh, tradition. I, I want to just, one other point, you know, we keep saying what people, 
everything we're doing is trying to figure out what did the evangelists believe. We don't know who they were, but whoever they were, we're trying to think, figure out what early Christians thought. Anything you say about what the real Jesus thought of what he was like, that is bordering on speculation. I mean, yeah. All we're trying to do is pen and figure out who the what the evangelists thought. So right, well, that's, that's very important there. Very I agree. Important point, which yeah. is ignored. That's all we're doing is we're trying to figure out what did the uh, to the the editor of the book of Matthew think? What was he thinking? And that's it. We you can't penetrate that. You could speculate, but regular it's it's speculation. That's all it is. Thank you about Jesus. Go ahead. Mr. Monster says, as I am half Ashkenazi myself, I enjoy listening to Rabbi Tovia. He is my favorite rabbi. I learn so much whenever he's on. That's a thank you. Thank you, Mr. Monster, for the super chat. Uh, Linda Roberts with the super sticker. Linda, thank you so much for that. I'm looking just to make sure I didn't miss anything from you. I did not miss anything. And right. uh, thank you. Considering Phlebas says, Eben Ezra says, the Isaiah 42 one servant is Isaiah. Uh, Gaon, G-A-O-N, I might have mispronounced his name, says Cyrus. Targ John says it is Isaiah 52 through 3 is about the King Messiah. So who is right? Okay. You want me to reread that? No, I kinda... no, I got it. I got okay. it. So I have an entire chapter on this in the volume one of Let's Get Biblical. But Derek, it, this is going to take just two minutes. Okay. I, when Isaiah identifies the servant as the righteous remnant of the Jewish people, as Israel, that does not mean that the Messiah is not included. The dispute, and I've never heard anyone explain this in the past, and that's why I just need to take a second, because people don't get this, and it's really very straightforward. The righteous remnant of Israel does not exclude the Messiah. The Messiah is included in that. Now, for those of you who are really into rabbinic writings, go to Tractate Sanhedrin 97, where the Messiah is with other righteous Jews at the gates of Rome, and they've got sores all over them. It's everybody. All the righteous remnant are suffering, the Messiah included. Okay? So it's not like Isaiah is only about the remnant of the Jews at the end of days, but the Messiah is not in there. The Messiah very much is a part of that. And that's why if you take a look at the Targum Yonason, please read it for yourself. I mean, it's, it's, someone must have translated it. This is very early and very important. Um, the Targum Yonason explicitly, if you look at 52, verse 13 through 15, the servant is referred to as the Messiah, but then just twist into 53, verse 1 and 2 and 3, and it's the nation of Israel. What's going on? Now we know what's going on. The Messiah has come. The nation will are shocked. I mean, the servant has been raised up, and the servant is the exemplary of the Jewish people. And who is the one who triggers the nations of the world to rethink everything? The Messiah. And then look at 53 verse 1 blowing through. What is Targum Yonason? Targum just means to translate, but it's an Aramaic translation of Isaiah. What does Targum Yonason say in Isaiah 50, 53 verse 1 and 2? It's the remnant of Israel. Oh, bingo, there you have it. And again, I, I say this to you. If you are reading some missionary book or you're getting your information from um, some missionary website, you don't have a chance. Conversely, if you read original sources, you're going to be just fine. You're safe. There's nothing to worry about it. But it's true that if you just read missionary websites, you're going to get loaded with this, and they're just they're just not going to tell you this. So it, you're 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 watching a magic show on the Las Vegas Strip. So there's your answer. I have a whole chapter on this, and let's get biblical volume one. Thank you. Thank you. Great question. Jeffrey Johnson says, "I want to express my appreciation for Derek and Rabbi Singer." Thank you, Jeffrey. I really appreciate that. Thanks for the okay. support. Grays174 says, have you interacted with James White's work? We're getting close to the end, by the way. Good. Um, no. No, I have not. That's someone I'm... I would like to see debate with you, but I just don't see him 
doing it. I, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. Um, uh, I, I've never, never interact with him. Couldn't tell you. You know of him a little? He's yeah. The I know that. Um, I, you know, the thing that I found striking about James White is that, that he's a, um, a real believer and he's a real believer in the Jewish Bible. And I appreciate that. I don't know why. One of the things I noticed that I watched through is I don't know why he debated this anti-Semite King James only guy. Oh, you're, I know what you're talking about. Let's right not even go into it because I don't want to have crazy people. So that's it. So I don't. I don't really know James White. I don't really know him, so I couldn't tell you more than that about him. I know that he believes in Reformed theology, so I don't. I'm not really familiar with him. Okay. All Thanks right. for that super chat. Two more. Considering Phlebas, the rabbi objects to Christian interpretations because they're past tense, but even Jewish scholars like Roddick acknowledge the prophetic perfect tense. Okay. You don't need the Radak for this. You don't need anybody for this. You can do, like, what do people think before the Radak? The Radak was a medieval commentator on the Bible. Very important. These people are not like going, hello, there I have something new. Like, what do people think of before the Radak? Okay. If I say tomorrow, Derek, you are gonna say, What did I do yesterday? You don't need to put prophetic past anywhere. So it's obvious I'm saying tomorrow you're gonna look back in hindsight and go back. Okay. That's all it is. It, this is not some fancy methodology. Like, no one ever heard of it before. All right? At the end of days, the Bible tells us what the nations will do. And in the past, they'll go, they will go, who would have believed our report? So, who, me, him, and Lishmo say, Isaiah 51, let's take the most controversial. Okay. Me, him, and Lishmo say, no, who would have believed our report? That's past tense. But it's something that didn't happen yet. The nations will say that at the end. So, you need a context, you need a device in the text to tell you that at the end, people are going to look backwards and go, boy, whatever, okay? This, you don't need redoc for this. Now, what happens when you're playing a game called hide the ball? Which means you're talking about, you're pointing to a passage in the Bible of something that really happened a long time ago and saying this is a future prophecy. You can't then say, okay, we can just, everything is so elastic, and thank goodness for Rabbi Radak. Really? And it's the Christians that insist that we're not rabbinic Judaism, we're just biblical Judaism. You know, this is, I don't blame the person because this is all over the internet, but, you know, you I say this to the Christians, you either are rabbinic Judaism or not. You can't say that the rabbis have invested with this special, unique knowledge, and therefore we could just follow them and then say, but we don't believe in rabbinic Judaism. I mean, choose which way you're going here. And if the rabbis really have this incredible power, that they can override the text, then Jesus is not the Messiah. Because all these rabbis rejected the claims of Christianity were willing to die for it. Many of them did. So stop that. So, of course, you don't need a prophetic past or anything like that. It's just... If the text is saying that in the future they will go back and say this, so bingo, you just this is not a some fancy nuanced device that's you device that's unique to the Bible. This is anything, and the Radak will point that out, but you're not getting a free pass when you molest the text. So when Isaiah chapter 9, verse 5 and 6, or 6 and 7, depending if you're using a Jewish or Christian Bible, well, all the verbs are in the past tense. You don't get a free pass to change it to the future tense and say it's a it's a prophetic past. You can't do that. And I want to, if I may, just close with this point, because okay? mm -hmm. this is we've never we've done many shows together, that, and I never. If there is a prophetic past going on in Isaiah nine, what's very important is Isaiah nine six and seven in the Christian Bible, five and six in the Hebrew Bible. This the numbers are cut differently for a reason we discussed earlier. The Christian Bibles take the words that are all in the past tense; they happen and literally mistranslate them to read in the future in the translations. His name shall be called wonderful. It doesn't say that. Okay, 
It doesn't say that. It's in the Vayikra means his name was called. It's past tense. A child has been born to us. Yulat is the perfect of past tense. You can't pl- change the translation. Now, I want to, I, I, I've never shared this with anyone on air, and I want to do this with you. I want to just do with this. Your favorite it, goy. <laughs> he's so cute. I, I had oh, to. I had to. Oh, Go ahead. Right. This is very important. So, there was a night I was on the air for like this, and we're, we're on air for a couple of hours, and suddenly you just got to clear your head out. So you go on YouTube and just watching something that's very interesting. And I was, oh, there's this this YouTube video. It's like tons of them where what custom agents, law enforcement agents at Heathrow Airport and other airports do to detect people who are smuggling drugs in airports or other illicit items. Okay, okay, and it's very interesting. Like they they see something suspicious, whatever. They're following the guy, and then they confront him, and then they do the search. Okay, and they have this they have this on YouTube videos, and it's really very gripping because it's real. It's like we're watching how people are when they're confronted, and they're like they're in a lot of trouble. Like how do they respond when they're accused? Okay, there's this one video I was watching blew my mind away. So for whatever reason, this guy had a one way, whatever it was, this guy did not look kosher landing in Heathrow and they're searching for drugs. Okay. And they're looking through a suitcase, nothing there, whatever. And then they decide they have to do a, a cavity check on the guy. And how do I say this politely? They found a cocaine place in a place where somebody sits down. Okay. Mm-hmm. They find cocaine wrapped up in the place where somebody sits down. By the way, the guy the whole time, as they're interviewing and questioning him, he looks like he's like gonna flay his face turning and spitzing his <laughs> he's like really uncomfortable. Really uncomfortable, okay. What happens next? Right? The law enforcement officials, as the guy, like, like what are you doing bring cocaine into the country? Like, what are you doing? Don't you know? He said, I didn't know it was illegal. The cops then say, then why did you stick it there? And I want to finish with this point. Because, like, if you didn't think cocaine is is illegal, like, what are you doing and sticking it there? And I want to speak to the King James. I want to speak to a new international version. I want to speak to the New American Standard. I want to talk to you for a moment. Why'd you stick it there? That means if you believe there's a path, past, per, a prophetic past, there's something, why did you mistranslate it? And then claim, I didn't know anything because we have the Red Doc to help us. This is the key question to you, the church, that has molested my Bible. Why did you stick it there? And don't tell me that you're relying on some rabbi. You could have rendered Isaiah 9 correctly. It translated it correctly. And then in your commentary say, but it's really a prophetic past. All right, you want to say that? We could talk. But don't mistranslate the text and say, I didn't know it was illegal. Like, why did you put it there? So saying that there's some novel device that a rabbi of the medieval period helps you out with will not rescue. This is a fig leaf. This is a game of three-card Monty. When you mis like, why you mistranslate? If it says that his name was called, then translate it that way. If you want to put a side note, footnote in there and go, whatever, do it. But don't lie to people. And you know, you, the translators of the Christian Bible, know that your readers can't don't know the difference between chaff and wheat. They don't know the difference between genuine Bible hermeneutics and fake Bible eisegesis, a fake reading of the text. And I, I rest my case on that. I charge you, the church, with manipulating the Jewish scriptures, and your answer just doesn't work. Your answer that there's some prophetic past going on here doesn't work. Why did you put it there? Why did you mistranslate it then? There is no answer to that question, and you are found guilty. Thank you. Wow, Rabbi, I had to put you full screen for that one. Um, I rest my case on that. We had one more uh, super chat that we didn't get to. Was uh, I believe it's one more? Maybe it's is the Rabbi Tobias' work unprecedented? As unprecedented? I don't. I don't know. 
I mean, Jews in the past defend the Jewish faith against the charges of the Christian faith, of course. Um, Nachmanides, in 1263, in the summer, held a, a debate with Pablo Cristiani in Spain. Um, you know, there are people who've written about this in the past. Thank you so um, much. Yeah, I mean, there are... I mean, you have to remember, I mean, people in the past had to figure where they were. Like, where am I? Like, if you live in 13th century France, you know, you just, you, you, you know, you had to be a little cautious, right? If you're living in Egypt, it means you're living in the Islamic world, and then you could speak more freely about Christianity. And obviously, this goes without saying. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, JIB, for the last little super chat it. thing. They said, What's Rabbi Singer's view of Hegesippus saying James could enter the sanctuary, only the high priest entered? So, how could he, or how could James, why would enter the sanctuary if Jesus already died for sins? Like, why would the whole sacrificial system go on and on and on uh, after Jesus was crucified if Jesus was the final sacrifice, as Hebrews tells us, Hebrews 10, verse 18, and uh, Romans chapter 6, and all over the place? And why is the sacrificial system going to be restored in full order in the Messianic age? See Ezekiel 41 through 48, and specifically 43, 44, 45. So, I mean, they don't, the, 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 the church has no, pro, it's just the texts don't fit. So you can have Matthew in the Sermon on the Mount saying that, that, you know, that, you know, I didn't come to change the law to fill it. And then you can have texts in Colossians and Romans that completely contradict it and say that everyone's a sinner. And then you can have Luke chapter one, verse six, saying that Zachariah and Elizabeth were sinless. And you could be asking this question of how, how they didn't care. And no one seems to notice this. I don't know why, but like when I say this to Christians, they actually start thumbing through the pages. They, people just don't notice these differences. And I, I think it's because they're just I don't know. They're 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 just when you, I guess you know when you're told that Jesus loves you as a child and you're going to go to hell if you don't believe in him, people just don't look at it. Just but the simple, not a very you don't need to be a scholar for this. I mean, this is just very simple stuff. Anyways, thank you for that question, Rabbi. Thank you so much. It's late over there. Uh, what is it? Midnight in Jerusalem. Yes, it is. So thank you for taking the time to hang out with me on a late night. I hope you enjoyed uh, the random questions that came in and. I know I did. I always enjoy hanging out with you and uh, looking forward to visiting you in October as well. That's right. You'll be here in the holiest land where you'll be circumcised and thrown to the mikvah. <laughs> and I... <laughs> your trip. Oh, you're funny. You're funny. Shalom to you. And it was a joy. We covered some new material that we actually, I don't know if I've ever covered before. So that was very exciting. Thank there's, you. There's always some some clever um, researchers. You know, people are constantly trying to figure things out. But of course, you also draw in a lot of people who I get these messages. Man, if I could share with you how crazy some of these uh, messages I've gotten in the past from like Christian apologists and stuff. I'm like, they hate you. I mean, it's like you can tell they they definitely can't stand you. They don't like me either. Trust me, because because I cater to allowing you to come on and poke holes and, and jab and things like that. But um, it is what it is. It is. What it is. You know, God, God forbid, if my enemies are rejoicing. God help me if if my enemies are praising me. So it's it's I, I hope they reconsider. And so many Christians have. But in truth, those who um, who are the enemies of the Jewish people and Jewish faith, if they're unhappy, that means we're doing okay. I get worried when the enemies of the Jewish faith rejoice. I know we're in a lot of trouble. Well, thanks for your time. I always enjoy it. I hope you, Myth Vision, enjoyed it. Like this video. Leave a comment after the live. Um, I do have a thanks button now. Thanks to Neil Gnostic Informant for telling me they exist. How do I not know with running a YouTube channel that there are new things that are coming out? Also a membership option, things like that. Please go and check out his website, um, outreachjudaism.org. And he has a couple books. I have them over my bookshelf over here in the corner. Also YouTube channel. So he's always constantly uh, doing new videos. 
please go check out Rabbi Tobia Singer's YouTube channel. And then, of course, we have a Patreon. I work very hard to publish works. In fact, when I'm done on here, I have a whole nother one on philosophy I did with Graham Oppie and uh, rationality rules. So be on the lookout for the new videos coming out. Thank you so much for your time, Rabbi. Always. And until next time, we are Myth Fishing. Don't any of you have the guts to play for blood? I'm your huckleberry. That's just my game.